All right, Sherry, could you tell us who you are and a little bit about what you do? Okay, thanks, Tamika. So my name is Sherry Jones. I am a philosophy, rhetoric, and game studies instructor. And I teach at Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design and a couple of other places. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'm like Tamika. I don't know how to say no to things. <laughs> We do too many things, you know. I know you're you're like me, so I also um, took on the chair position for the this is very long International Society for Technology and Education Holy Game cats. and Simulation Network. So there's like currently like 2,500 professors, teachers, and professors in the network, and yeah. what we're trying to figure out is how to use games and simulation, VR, XR, whatever, to enhance education. So that's that little network. Yeah. I also, again, can't say no, um, became the steering committee board member for the International Game Developers Association, um, learning games and education, learning education and games division. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'm doing over there is I'm not working with professors. I'm actually working with developers. Okay. So developers who are trying to figure out how to make games that can be educational, can be, you know, insightful. So at one hand, I'm working with software developers. On the other hand, I'm, I'm steeply in academia. So that's for now. That's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And I, I love this. I love um, these. The, um, so the work you do, like, like I was saying before, I'm very excited about it and a little intimidated by it because I, my knowledge of it is so slight. Um, and I also think about like um, just the um, gaming influence on almost everything I feel like that's digital now. Um, and I was wondering if you delve into that at all. Uh, yeah, so first of all, let's get some of the, I mean, this is an old debate, but we might as well get it out of the way. Games are no longer frivolous things. Right. I remember, and I've been presenting, I present a lot of academic conferences, I'm sure you do too. And at academic conferences, I will often mention the idea to bring in games, whether it's board games or digital games. And I've been told at academic conferences that I'm doing very low brow stuff. <laughs> yeah, or it's beneath me, yes. Yeah. Um, so let's get the idea out of the way is that games are not just play things because like other medium as you know like television uh movies um even TikTok videos there are hidden messages right in all the kind of mediums that we're playing with yep. and the sad part is games i shouldn't say sad part but games are number one medium being consumed on a global scale. It, it has surpassed everything. So movies have fallen behind. It probably is going to go obsolete, but games are going to stay. Um, so of course, for, for us, it's very important to think about the impact that games have on people and pretty much everybody. And I don't know if this will show. Here's my uh, mobile phone that's not showing correctly. But <laughs> everybody has, I, I bet you anything, that anybody you talk to has a mobile game or something, whether it is a uh, Candy Crush Saga or right. Angry Birds or something silly installed on their phone because pretty much everyone is working and they're playing games. So if you think about the actual effect, the influence, it has a lot of reach. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and. Uh... I know I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, multiple games I have, and I don't consider myself necessarily a gamer um, because I know folks who are like really steeply into, I guess, gaming culture. Um, and and th like you were saying, it, it is touching all of us. Like I can name at least four or five different gaming systems that have been in my life not related to PCs or laptops. So it's, um, and of course, all of, our, all of our computers, if we don't build them ourselves, come pre-installed with a bunch of games, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I do want to say something in response to what you just said, because as women, as, as a bigger community, as the diverse group, both of us represent diverse <laughs> groups. Um, I, I want to put this to rest. I, I don't like the label. It's kind of like where people are having problem with gender labels. And I say, well, why not? Same thing with games and gamer. The fact that you play a game makes you a gamer. 
Okay. If you say, it, and again, this is a conversation with those hardcore, so-called hardcore gamers who say, well, you're not a gamer. It's actually a very masculine attitude. It actually is very sexist. Okay. And specifically, they say this often to women, say, you're not a gamer, because what does a gamer mean? A person who's skillful, who can think rationally. Women can't think rationally, therefore, you can't be a gamer. Or you're not very skilled because you're physically weak. I'm very allergic to this term. And we talked about this with my philosophy students, with my English students. It's just a horrible term. It's kind of the culture war in the last few years that just kind of disease and still with us. Cool. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, and it makes me feel better too. Like, hell yeah. Uh, Cause like, <laughs> I, um, so like Costco, right? You, you tell the person to put all the things in one box cause you can eye eyeball it. You're like, um, you can Tetris that in, you know, to fit perfectly. And you can always tell who played Tetris and who didn't yeah. literally. I'm like, oh my gosh, you played a lot of Tetris or like, mm. I'm going to have to repack this myself, you know? Um, and so like, that's, that's something we don't talk about a lot either. I think um, that is super important is like, there are a lot of like really high caliber um, problem solving skills that can come out of being, you know, playing video games. Yes. Um, and this, that's why there's a whole new genre of sports called esports, right? That's kind of proliferating everywhere uh -huh. where, where the, it's now recognized as a real sport. And some people who are playing it play like, I don't know, tournaments for like 20 hours, 30 hours, 40 Ooh. hours. Yeah, those are insane tournaments and they have teams and so forth. So my interest is not, you know, for my own interests as a philosophy person, I'm not particularly interested in how, you know, how games develop your hand and eye coordination, which is obviously important, right, in the physical sense. I'm more concerned about how it influences us on the intellectual level. And right. again, because people think they're frivolous playthings, they go, well, it's not saying anything to me. Like right. television is not saying anything to me. No one's saying that anymore. I don't think anyone <laughs> believes that. You know? We might be in the golden age of television. Um, at least one of my friends says so, especially if you're thinking about spaces like Hulu and Amazon and Netflix. There's some cool stuff happening over there. Well, yeah, certainly the classic, you know, with the 300 channels of nothing. Um, <laughs> now there's all these, these you know, uh, particular, like for example, Netflix as a space. And also what, what I think that's interesting about Netflix is now they're able to offer foreign films and foreign shows in the original language instead of, yes. you know, voiceover, which sounds awful and destroy the acting. So I do see yeah. the point. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, I want to get back to the uh, leapfrog, leap, leapfrog backwards a little bit. You're talking about um, philosophy in games. Um, and um, that's that's exactly why I want to talk with you because I want to know more about like how those two places conjunct, especially now. So um, so let's stepping back a bit regarding philosophy. So for me, it was very easy to see a connection, but I understand why people say, well, why would you mix those two up? So philosophy is a discipline of asking why, so we can understand how the world functions. Every single discipline that we can think of came out of philosophy, right? Every single discipline. And why? Because there's specialization of the why question that we ask. And some people just specialize in trying to find through a scientific method, through a literary method to find out the answer, right? That philosophy started asking. But philosophy is not just a child asking random questions, go why, why, why? We're trying to create rational structure, logical structure to understand whether or not our questions have merit or how do we build upon that question to lead to other questions that can help us understand how the world works. Now, one trend in philosophy, and uh, I, I want to give credit to philosopher and professor Judith uh, Jarvis Thompson, um, female philosopher, which who I love. Um, she started, I mean, she's not the first one, but her thought experiments kind of brought attention to thought experiments. So what exactly are thought experiments? Thought experiments are hypothetical scenario, kind of like a fictional story, yeah. where you're testing out a rational concept. So you think, let's see if this idea, this concept, right, the scenario makes sense. So I'm going to construct this hypothetical scenario to test out this logical structure. Now, in philosophy, we often give students a hypothetical scenario to say, is this right? right? Is this ethically correct or wrong? Or is this in the moral round or ethical round? Do you understand that? Or what about on the legal round? So we help students think 
by giving the hypothetical. But when I started looking at games, I start to realize something. Games do something more than um, novels, than television, mm -hmm. which is the consumer reads the text, right? And we have to imagine in our head the scenario, okay? Mm -hmm. Same thing with television, we're watching passively and we're imagining scenario. Now, some people are allergic to me bringing up the word interactivity because they're going to argue that when you're imagining, that's a form of interactivity. Now, I'm not going to really dispute that, but the way we discuss it in the game studies community, okay, is the idea that interactivity actually involves physical body movement and actually making choices while physical body movement is occurring. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at a game, it's different than just reading a hypothetical scenario. I'm actually having to force to move my, make decisions inside a game, right? Make body movements to see if I can test out my theory that this was the right action to do, or that I think that the consequence will be good. So for me, there's a very easy bridge is why can't I use games as a tool to help students think about the philosophical theories that we taught them? That's where the intersection was for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, my brain, um, it lagged behind a little bit because I'm processing that a little bit. Um, <laughs> and I, now I'm not totally sure where to go. Uh, what I can give you is um, a specific example because okay. I know it, is, it sounds convoluted because, you know, um, oh, no. yeah, and, and if you don't mind, and I'm just, yeah, I don't absolutely. want to screen share on you. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. That's okay? okay. Are you able to? Yeah, do yeah. it. So let me, let me do something really quick because for, for the viewers, it's a lot easier to see it than me just talking at the screen, okay? So let me, hold on one second. Actually, you have to give me give you ability permission. to screen share. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Continuous advanced. You just click on participant and allow me to. Did that work? Let me see. Awesome. Yes, it did. Sweet. Okay. So give me one sec while I go back to this. Okay. So first of all, let me, let me this is Professor and philosopher Judith Jarvis Thompson. She wrote a very famous uh, philosophical article called a defense of abortion. Now I know this is a scary topic. Okay. But this is a must read in my philosophy classes. I don't care if a student has a reaction. This is something that they have to read. Yeah. So one of the, uh, thought experiment that, that professor Thompson provided in her article, and I'm just going to read this bit. Okay. I'm just going to read this really quick. Okay. And can you see this? Okay. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So, but now let me ask you to imagine this. You wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous unconscious violinist. He has been found to have fatal kidney ailment and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you and last night, the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours so that your kidneys can be used to extract poison from his blood as well as your own. Mm -hmm. The director of the hospital now tells you, quote, look, we're sorry. The Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would never have permitted it if we had known, but still, they did it. And the violinist is now plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him. But never mind, it's only for nine months but then he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. Here's the question. Is it morally incumbent on you to accede to this situation? No doubt it would be very nice of you if you did, a great kindness, but do you have to accede to it? What if it were not nine months, but nine years or longer still? What if the director of the hospital says, quote, tough luck, I agree, but now you've got to stay in bed and the violinist is plugged into you for the rest of your life. Because remember this, all persons have a right to life and violinists are persons. Granted, you have the right to decide what happens in and to your body, but a person's right to life outweighs your right to decide what happens in and to your body. So you can e never, ever be unplugged from him. I imagine you would regard this as outrageous, which suggests that something really is wrong with this plausible sounding argument I mentioned a moment ago. So I'm going to pause right here because we're not going to read more of this. Are you seeing what she's trying to do here? Yeah, I think so. Uh, 
it's just i mean it, it's literally putting you in the shoes of this question right um right. and uh, i will give not it's not a test or anything but the idea yeah. is that she uh professor thomas uh, thompson has constructed a scenario where basically the person who's plugged into you is the fetus <laughs> oh aha uh -huh, relies on your body to survive Okay. And you say, well, wait a second, I got kidnapped here. Um, why do I need to sustain this person's life? Because the society of music lovers say this is a very important person. And if you if you unplug, then, then that person will die. So mm -hmm. here is the yellow part. Granted, you have a right to decide what happens in and to your body, but a person's right to life outweighs your right to decide what happens in yeah. and to your body. Now, in this scenario, most students were reading, well, that's, that's ludicrous. Now, why right. is it easy for someone to say, well, that's ludicrous? Because we have taken them out of a scenario that they're stuck on, a real world scenario that they're stuck on, which is the idea, well, can a fetus stay in the woman's body? Can we force a woman to carry a fetus? But when you switch that scenario, turn it into a thought experiment, when you remove the context and give it a new context, it helps students understand the illogicalness of the scenario. This is what we mean by a thought experiment. Okay. Okay. Now I will, I will stop sharing cause I don't want to <laughs> occupy your screen. Oh no, there. that's cool. Yeah. I'm like, I'm absolutely fascinated. And actually like, um, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm like, there are so many different situations where I'm thinking this is the kind of thing we need, like these kinds of thought experiments, because it's so difficult to get out of like certain ways of seeing like a lot, um, m most of us, if not all at some point, we're very myop myopic or myopic, I'm sorry. And like, just like, you know, it's hard to see out of that unless there's another like, like reframing is even difficult. So like this kind of thought experiment is like, whoa, wait a second. Like, this is, this is the context of this thing. Um, and those things that made you feel uncomfortable, now you get to like query that. Um, right. Yeah, and so that's super powerful. Um, and the, 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 the context, and often we know that people, we know that people are not always rational way to make decisions, but also from neuroscience, okay? Neuroscience research is that when we make decision, emotion is actually involved in decision-making and also in rationality. So they're actually tied together. But my point is this, sometimes we are biased in the way we make decisions because we feel passionate about scenario. We feel personally affected by a scenario, or personally attacked by the scenario. Right. So when you take a scenario that you feel personally attacked or some, some weird agenda is there, you take it out and just say, let's just talk objectively about this scenario by replacing some of the objects and, and people in a different context. Can you see that there are problems so, with this line of thinking? So that is the purpose of a thought experiment. Now, in philosophy, uh, her, her thought is pretty famous, but we do this often because philosophy is a very complicated subject. Mm -hmm. So to help students understand all these really very difficult you know, theories, I myself as a professor often construct thought experiments to help students go, oh, I see what you mean now. I see what we mean by capital punishment. Instead of thinking of the killing part, we switch it out. So no matter what topic it is, we're not afraid to talk about it. We don't ban topics in our classes. And I am not afraid of students getting angry because <laughs> we will say, well, you're not really being objective in this right. discussion. So, so the connection there is sometimes I see games. I see lots of games acting as thought experiments. So even if the developer didn't realize how they were doing that, I see right. some games as very, very appropriate as thought experiments, right? right. Um, and I could, and again, I don't, I don't want to screen share for it. Well, oh, no, I'm happy to. Okay, I'll screen share yeah. just a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah, totally cool. Okay, cool. So let me go back to my screen. Hold on. Okay. So maybe the other screen. I got too many windows. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little website, and this is open. Uh, it's free for anyone to access. You know, it's a, I, I'm a big OER advocate. So for those who don't know what OER is, is Open Educational Resources. Yes. I publish free textbooks. I'm sure you do too. You know, uh, free textbooks. <laughs> well, 
you're, I'm sure you're almost there. You're just gonna, you just need time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I publish videos like yourself. I publish videos, uh, articles, I write things and I publish on what on the web. And I'm a big advocate for sharing all my pedagogical material online. So one of the sites that I have is called the eternal polymath. Um, and polymath is a person who likes to learn a lot of everything. So I see myself as, as well as you as a polymath. So this is my little ethics and game series. So this is one of the many, many series I've developed. So if we drop down, for example, games and psychology, there's three series there. Uh, and there's also interactive fiction and history. So there's a lot of series I've been doing throughout the years, but ethics and game series, um, the goal of the series, and I'll make it a little bit bigger because obviously it's hard to see. And I just didn't want to repeat myself too many times. Yeah. So here's what I, here's my goal when I develop the series. Okay. So a couple of things is that like we were discussing video game is the most popular medium in the world. And the fact that the medium expresses rhetorical messages that are politically, culturally, or socially charged means we need to study it. Okay, that's one. Uh, second is that video games, which are developed by developers, right, from different persuasion, you know, from all over the world, reinforce the systems of belief, whether it's conscious or unconscious of the developer, whether it's a system belief of a culture. So let's say if I'm making a game in China or for the Chinese audience, I'm going to make a game that maybe reinforces a system of belief so I can sell my game. That is also kind of problematic, but at the same time, for researchers, it's great to understand cultural thinking that's actually embedded in video games to please the player, mm. okay? Also, we have theories of ethics and philosophy, which I'll cover in just a bit, that analyzes the socio-political situation simulated by video games, again, conscious or unconscious. And lastly, we can become more responsible and ethical thinkers when we can reflect on games because games are everywhere. And if we don't think about it, it will influence our thinking without us knowing. Okay. okay. And that's, that's a powerful thing. And, uh, you know, we talked about digital literacy and we try to teach students how to analyze, for example, a television show or a news report to see if it's true or not. Same thing with games. It's, it's way worse. It's way worse than news reports. It's everywhere. And I bet, and you're as you're a professor as well. I yeah. bet that when we're teaching classes, that the students are probably playing a game on the side, but we're actually lecturing. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, so the thing is, and I'll show one, and I won't, you know, take up all this. And and yes, I've been. I was interviewed by the uh, um, by Wired UK. Yep. regarding my little series, uh, this particular series, because they were fascinated too with how the heck do you combine video games with philosophy, right? And this was a particular feature about Fallout. Um, and I'm going to go down to, okay. So here are the games I've done, and I haven't had time to go back because I've been very busy with other things lately. <laughs> but the one in 2018, I covered the following games. Uh, Observer, Detention, To the Moon, The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, Life is Strange, The Talos Principle, and Fall Shelter. Now, Fall Shelter might be more famous and maybe Life is Strange. Fall Shelter is the mobile game version of the Fallout series. Okay. So the Fallout series, as you know, is the, you know, the, the, the nuclear uh, fallout and uh, people live underground and people are in shelters and there's a big old battle. That's what that is. Um, but specifically, for example, if we take a look at Observer, and this is a screenshot, and I made this a little too big, so I'm just going to... Oh, wow. Yeah. Oops. So, yeah, I made it too big. <laughs> so, Observer is a very, very, very trippy cyberpunk game that I don't recommend for, you know, young children. Um, there are really graphic things inside this. And this is what I'm saying is why are we not studying this? This is more violent than any movie I've seen in recent years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what you're seeing as a woman that's plugged into a machine and then she's being controlled. Her mind is being controlled by that machine. Now it's even worse than that. So in the section when, when folks, and again, I can give you links afterwards and stuff, but when folks come into the series, I explain what the series is. So for example, Observer is a 2017 game, a first person psychological horror indie game with a cyberpunk theme developed by Asper. 
it was set in 2084 by Chiron, uh, when Chiron Corporation establishes and run the fifth Polish Republic government. So funny that the Polish took over the world. Uh, neuro hacking and cybernetic body augmentation become legal and virtual reality and hologram technology are the new drugs. Mm -hmm. So people can no longer live in a misery of what's happening around them due to climate change, due to bad environment, that they now need to live in virtual reality and hologram in order to continue to want to live. So wow. it's a really, really morbid uh, future. Yeah. But in this, and, and by the way, this is the fun part. The, the main character is Daniel Lazarki, which is voiced by Rutger Howard before he passed away. Okay. Um, so this was the last project that he, Rutger Howard did, and it was a video game that he did. And how did I connect philosophy? For example, so I brought in animalism, David Hume, philosopher David Hume's personal identity theory to mm -hmm. discuss the problem, the specific problem of body augmentation. So body augmentation, right? Cybernetic body augmentation is people can replace arms, leg, body parts to enhance themselves. Mm -hmm. And in this particular storyline, if you don't replace your body parts, no one will hire you because you're no longer efficient as a human being. Human beings are no longer good enough as human beings. We have become, we have to become part machine in order to compete in, 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 in the job market. So this is not some kind of weird, you know, Terminator story. It's literally a grim look, a very possible look into the future where everyone has to do augmentation. Now we know from Elon Musk, he's trying to push the neural link, right? The neural link where you yeah. uh, connect to your brain can hear music. That's mm -hmm. actually first step to yep. this future that science fiction writers have been predicting for a very, very long time. And this series, and I have a video and, and slides, this series, we kind of go step-by-step uh, step through the game on how we dissect the meaning of the game using philosophical theory. So I'll bring it back to you for a sec. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see. You, you wanted me to stop the share? Uh, I can stop the share. Yeah. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Or we don't have to. Um, a lot of this, like, I, I, um, like, I mean, every time I talk with you, my mind gets blown a little bit because it's like um, my, my world has become a, a little bit insular in some ways. And just like, just my brain is quickly, um, like, thinking about, like, just like um, how there's barely any sci-fi anymore. It's happening now. And like, um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it feels like it is happening in, in gaming. So like, but I think what it is, is we're closer to it than we were in like, say the fifties or sixties. Um, it's like right around the corner for us. Um, like, you know, Lady Gaga is thinking about having a, being the first to have a concert on the moon or something crazy like that. Or like, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm getting it wrong. I think it was just in outer space or on the moon, something like that. And then, um, Elon Musk is like, that character we've seen in so many sci-fi books, um, like creating these kind of seemingly fantastic realities that are actually just like right around the corner. Um, and um, my ping pong brain also goes to um, the, I can't remember what it's called, but um, people who are already starting to implement um, like robotic parts, like even um, neurologically um, as a movement. Do you know kind of what I'm talking about? Um, and there's one person in particular, I see him and stuff, but I just can't, I can't um, bring his name up for some reason in my brain. But um, I don't, I don't necessarily have a question. It's just like, um, like I, I can see like how, so the way I was coming from it before where um, there are some MMOs that um, people are venturing out into outer space and like um, solving really big problems. So like going out into like a space that keeps adapting and keeps growing and keeps being developed, um, not only by the, by the pl uh, people who make the game, but by the players. And so on multiple different levels. And so it's like worlds within worlds and uh, people have to solve a lot of really big issues like um, a dying planet or like um, um, society of rogue pirate uh, ships that just kind of destroy everything in the game and stuff like that. Um, or just some of the things that I kind of got glimpses of 
Um, and it's just like this brutal, wild space that happens um, inside of these games. And so um, that's what I was thinking of, like, like sociologically and stuff. Um, and then also thinking about just like where humans are going. Um, so what you're saying is um, like, as we're kind of evolving into this other space that's integrating technology, um, whether we want it to happen or not, um, that's what's happening. And then um, there are some very real issues that are happening like in the environment and all these other things that we already see like the stressors and the depression and everything else of, and I know I've definitely felt it of like, what's the fucking point? right? Like, we're destroying the fucking world. And like, what's the fucking point? And so that's an interesting idea that a game is like presenting this idea that um, uh, in order for us to want to keep living, we create these alternate realities, which actually we already are like Animal Crossing has been huge during this pandemic, right? Um, this very silly game where you go and go to an island and pretty much you're doing all the work for everyone on the island but um but it's still fun and lighthearted and um you know a world within a world um and it also teaches its own things too like um how to be neighborly um and just other other things that i find interesting um but not getting too far off track like i wish i had an actual question i'm just absolutely fascinated by this it's just like i want to unpack and I, I do, yeah. I do look, it's a, it's a lot, right? And yeah. I, this, I know. Oh, uh, so let's pack a few things because it's really fascinating. It might not be exactly directly about games, but yeah. let's talk a little bit about current philosophical movement that might be uncomfortable to think about. Okay. Right. Philosophy is not this dead thing, it's constantly evolving, and we are usually. 60 years, 100 years ahead of everybody else. We already figured this out hundreds of years ago. It's not, it's not new to us. Yeah. Um, but when artificial intelligence came about, okay, the, philosoph the philosophers, philosophers of technology were very concerned about the, pop, you know, the, the eventual end of human beings due to artificial intelligence because we can't really compete with them. So mm -hmm. there's a group of people who are really into AI because they believe that it can improve human life. But again, improve human life to the extent of what, right? So that's one group of people really into AI. And I am not dismissing scientists who are developing AI. I'm just saying that that's the frame of fears, right, regarding AI. So another group of philosophers and scientists decided, well, we're going to be anti that movement. So mm -hmm. we are going to call ourselves IA. So IA stands for Intelligence Amplification. Intelligence Amplification stands for amplifying human intelligence rather than artificially creating an intelligence that could replace us because artificial the word artificial means man-made and i think the word is pretty sexist so let's say human made right okay? so human made intelligence so we're saying well ia people say well i don't like that i, I think that you're trying to say that first you're you're in you think that they're going to be slave to us and they will do everything for us uh, right. assuming that they don't come become conscious and start to realize they have will and they have whatever. That's so gonna be fun. eventually, yeah, yeah. And eventually, and, and without talking even about the science fiction of consciousness here, okay, because we don't really even believe it's gonna happen within the next how many years. But the idea is human beings, we have this particular disease and we know this in philosophy. We are always striving for efficiency. Okay, yep. But here's the problem. Human beings are not perfect. The word perfect actually means static as in no change. If you are perfect like God, there is no any part of you that needs change, right? Because you're perfect. But human being by the nature of our maturation and the fact that we have cellular degeneration and, and regrowth means that we will never be perfect. But yet our brain desire, we have this desire for efficiency. Why? Efficiency help us survive. It's a survival mechanism that kicks in to say we want efficiency. So efficiency led us to develop lots of technologies to the point now where technology might exceed our own level of efficiency. So instead of aiding us, it might overcome, it might make us obsolete. So the IA group are saying, wait, 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 wait. How about we go the other direction, which is amplifying intelligence, right? But what you were saying earlier, there's a term for what you're saying, which is biohacking. So the biohacker, 
you know, it's, it's DIY, you know, do it at home, do it yourself. So they usually try to replace an arm or a leg or try to put chips, right? Uh, chips and MFC chips or something in their body so they can scan the grocery store. <laughs> But that's the idea is, hey, we are better than the biological body that we are given. Okay. Now, here's another scenario that's really scary. So we just talked about a little bit of history about computer science and philosophy. But here's another thing that's really scary. So I know you just said earlier, and I agree with you. Sometimes you think about our environment, climate change, you go, well, F this. What's the point, right? Because everything seems to fall apart. Our mm -hmm. politics is horrendous. Um, I'm scared and I'm hiding at home just like you. <laughs> I don't like what's happening out there. But you know what the futurists, so f futurists are people who think about the future as how do we, they believe in thinking about the future so we can think about how to construct technology to get us there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the futurists are saying, well, you know what? Let's just accept the scenario that the earth is not going to survive. Let's accept the scenario that oxygen is going to be it's going to be few, it's going to be replaced by carbon monoxide. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be polluted beyond belief that we can't even inhale anymore and the water will be so polluted we can't drink it. Right. So then the solution is, well, we just become robotic parts. That's the solution. Mm -hmm. That the, 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 the one I just showed you, the, the, the observer, is actually a fantasy, a science fiction fantasy that I don't think is that far off. The idea that because our body is frail, all of our body is soft, a body that we have blood coursing through us. And if the pandemic demonstrate anything to us is we are very, very vulnerable. Yep. Right. So the futurists are arguing, why don't we just replace this body? So there's a whole other group of people about uh, totally into neural uh, amplification, body yeah. amplification and Elon Musk is actually part of that group. He he did not come up with any of these concepts. A lot of people give him too much credit. He borrowed a lot of ideas from philosophy and neuroscientists, but never give him any any credit. And he says, "Oh, here's this new concept about amplifying." We're, we're like, we we know that already. <laughs> this right. has already been argued. It's just right. like you're trying to be the technician and creating the the link that's possible, right? And mm -hmm. the technology he's working with, he didn't come up with that. MIT. Right. Multiple yeah. universities have been working on it for, for decades and decades and decades. And he finally was the one with the capital. Right. To work on it. So people give him too much credit. Like he's a genius. For it. I'm like, no, this, See, this has been around for a while. And that, that's what I've been thinking about this whole time is like MIT, like what MIT is, is there thinking not just 50 years in the future, maybe not even just 100 years in the future, but 150 and 200, like they're thinking way in the future to like um, come up with solutions we don't even know we need yet, um, which is like, that's, that's an interesting space to wrap your head around, right? Like that there is this place that exists that is thinking that far ahead. And yeah. most of us, most of us are trying to, you know, figure out how to make uh, $600 this week so we can like pay rent or whatever, you know? Um, so like, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I've been thinking this whole time. Like that's like where folks kind of gather for that kind of work. Um, and it's right. interesting something else I'm thinking about is just like all these little peeks into like this kind of um, integration with tech. So like, you know, there was Google Glass that got tried out and then you keep seeing like the smattering of different companies that are trying to do something similar to Google Glass and they're not working somehow, but you know, those, those things are getting worked out in the meantime. And then like, um, like you said, the Neuralink um, and obviously other wearable tech that seems more, um, that seems less scary to people, you know, like, oh, I'm just checking my heartbeat or my blood sugar levels or whatever. Um, or, um, you know, maybe my Google, there's an app that tells me when I'm snoring at night. <laughs> so, like, stuff you know, like that. <laughs> we talk about, you, you know, what's really funny. And we're, we, again, sounds great, right? And you're right. You're right. This, mm -hmm. this technology, whether we want it or not, it's just happening. Mm -hmm. So what I do, because I specialize in ethics. Like yes. Ethics, yeah. Um, what we're trying to do is to come up with ethics, ethics that that yeah. can help clear this future because we can't just go. No, I'm scared of this. No, that's not how the world works. Right. 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 So here's an example that might scare you. So uh, what was it? When 20, 2017, 2016, Fitbit tried to 
change the law in Australia so that if you want to have health insurance, you must wear a Fitbit on your wrist. Oh, wow. <laughs> they're trying they're saying, it out already. Yep. You can see why. They're going, well, you're not walking enough today. We're going to raise your, your health insurance premium. So right. it's happening. And in fact, a lot of American health insurance companies wanted this to happen here, but there are some policies trying to push back. So this is not some kind of far out thing. Right. These people already predicted that this is going to happen, mm -hmm. right? And we see cases over in Australia that's happening. For example, in, in China, uh, they have hundreds of thousands right, of surveillance cameras, and they're probably in the millions now, of surveillance cameras installed all over China. And I'm going to say this without naming companies, you can probably believe companies now. China didn't just come up with that money. It was the U.S. company, major tech companies, and you can probably uh, think of that funded China's project mm -hmm. because they want the data from China. They want China to spy on their citizens, install cameras everywhere so they can grab that data and calculate what, what the consumers are buying, what they're doing, and so forth. So when we blame China, understand that the U.S. interests are also involved. This is not some innocuous exchange or to demonize one country. And I, I bring up China because China is doing a lot of awful things lately. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to, I have to say this because I'm kind of worried. I'm like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> at the same time, when we trace down the the rabbit hole, we start to see really bad things happening, which is they're they're using surveillance camera to to matrix to trace their citizens. And right now, for example, they have the social credit score, and I'm you have heard of the social credit score, right? I haven't actually. Okay, but so I can guess. Yeah. Okay, so, so you know how in America we have a credit score, right, to, to determine whether we can get a rent an apartment or buy a car, our credit score. China has a system called the social credit score, which is not only assessing your credit worthiness, but also whether or not you're socially responsible. Now, that sounds good, but here's no. an example. <laughs> I'm like, no, because who, 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 yeah, please continue. <laughs> I don't like so, this. <laughs> so it's, it's monitoring your social behavior. So for example, let's say I went to Costco because Costco went to China already. So mm -hmm. I go into a Costco and I decide I'm going to throw a party for you and me and somebody else. Okay. So I decide to go in there. I'm going to buy six bottles of wine. Now the camera will actually matrix and actually check and say, oh, you bottle six bottles of wine. And they will, they will actually record that. And it will send me you know, a uh, 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 email or text that say your social credit score have been decreased because you're buying six bottles of wine and that is not good social behavior. So right. they measure it. So the idea is that you start, I think the current credit scores, everyone started at a thousand, but they just keep deleting that based on your behavior. Or for example, you jaywalk today so they take 50 points off. Or for example, you threw the trash on the ground, minus a hundred points. Again, that might sound great, but imagine a government monitoring all your movements. Or what if they say it is not okay to have a mini concert on the street? So you decided to sing uh, for folks. So I know you know you're a singer, and you decide to sing for people. And they say, oh, "How dare you? That is against the government rule. You know you can't sing. That's bad social behavior. Minus one thousand for for Tamika. Mm. That is an awful, awful system that they have in place." And then the, here's the joke. I have a couple of uh, philosophy, not philosophy, but, but professor friends who went to China, and this is what they told me that they had to do. So when they got to China, they their company had to bribe the government. So they say, when they get there, it's zero. They get zero points, okay? So they say, well, we, we need to be able to like get on a bus because if your social credit score is too low, you can't get on a bus, you can't get on a train, you can't even get on a plane to leave the country, right? Wow, so, yeah. The companies, they just bribe this official and they'll bump your social credit score to like 2000 and just don't screw up. So there are literally American journalists and professors who are stuck in China and can't leave because China determined that their social credit score is too low for them to leave the country. Oh my gosh. Let's talk about tech problems. Right. This is like <laughs> a, this is a black, a black mirror episode that we thought was just fiction. It's. You know, and I and I tell my students with sci-fi, why do I use sci-fi to teach? It yeah. is not that there's some kind of weird, it's that sci-fi is, again, frivolous. It's more like this. 
computer scientists and engineers like us are in love with the sci-fi that we watch when we were little. Okay, mm -hmm. so many of them, once they get their degrees and their specialty, start to try to develop the technology that they saw in sci-fi. So it's not as if sci-fi predicts anything. It doesn't predict anything. It's more as an it's an imagination of what human beings can become, and we try to become that. So it becomes scary when you see all those nightmare scenarios and someone tried to make the technology to make that happen. That's interesting. I know I I never thought of it that way um it, it, and that i mean it makes total sense like we're inspired by what we're inspired by and uh, like um you know all of us and like you were saying there's that like impetus to be efficient um and also to you know wonder what kind of worlds we can create you know everything from the hippy dippy folks who want the commune growing their own fruit and shit you know like with all their best buds to like um hey like what if we could solve these major issues and like you know still exist in a world that we broke <laughs> you're right um, yeah and then you know those fantasies that we create again mm -hmm. here's the thing about fantasies and human brain is very very limited because why yeah. We can imagine fantasies, but unlike reality, we can't calculate every possible incidents, right? right? Incidentals, accidents. We can't. We are not machines. We can't calculate all the possible accidents, possible failures of this thing. So of course our fantasies are beautiful because we don't address the possible failure of the system. So a game in game studies, going back to game studies now, yeah. game is a system, a system of a world where we created right a fantasy where we've created and it sounds beautiful and it looks beautiful and it works in its own internal logic but the idea is it only works in his internal logic because it's not reality reality has unexpectedness for example no one well except well no one sex to scientists for foresee the the the, the, the pandemic okay right. i certainly did not see it because i'm not a specialist in uh, epidemiology, I did not know it. So when it came about, I started to do research and go, oh, I see. Now I understand yeah. what's happening. They've been predicting this for 20 years. I was just not aware. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, th this is, <laughs> we, t we talked about these science fiction, right? As, as we live out these scenarios. And when I teach philosophy and we te teach games and so forth, this is why I like to use science fiction themes when I teach. And this is why games often have scientific fiction themes because they can be as fantastical as possible. And right. then my students and I can start to crack the irrationality of the scenario that's been presented or introduce an incidental, like for example, if a pandemic happened, would this world hold up the way it's been envisioned? Would this still hold up? That's when it becomes really, really fun. Mm -hmm. And with me and my, my, my student and I, I don't just ask them to be consumer of games because that's one thing. You play your game and have fun and we have laughs. But I actually tell students to become game designers. Um, some who are brave, I actually get them to make games with me. So I say, create another scenario. So we play this game. You yeah. saw all the holes and problems with this game, with the world that's been created, okay? And you saw inequity in this. You saw sexism in this. And you don't think this is the way it should be made, right? So how do we create another world that actually plug up the holes that you see in the existing world that the developer made? So my students also make games as an intellectual exercise, not for selling. If you want to sell, you can, but we do it as an intellectual exercise because I believe that if people do more intellectual exercises, we will all be in a better place. Really. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, oh my gosh. I don't even know where to get started on that, but there's definitely a difference, like being in a room up full of people who, look, I like my my fair share of woo woo and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, but the thing is, is if we're not, so like an exercise I'm doing with some of my students right now is, um, and as I learn how ethics works, as specifically with engineers, is just like. Um, all of us have our own impetus and our passions and our drives and the things that we carry with us from growing up and all these other things. So we have our certain way of seeing and we usually pretty blindly move through the world and we don't know necessarily why we because we haven't queried it. 
But that's the thing. What happens when we query this way of being, our way of being? Like, um, it's it's it, it something else happens there. It's like um, a certain, obviously, it's a certain kind of preparedness, um, and probably probably a lot of cognitive dissonance too. But when you're when you're when you uh, get to know all of those things, all of a sudden you're really super sure on your own feet. And as you enter into the world, into this broader conversation. Um, you, you know, you're sure of yourself in a certain way and um, hopefully still open to listening to all these other experiences too. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, and um, adding to the piece what you're saying, which is very important, especially when you talk about folks uh, with, with your student that you're, you'll be teaching um, <laughs> technology, but they're very te technologically minded and you talk yes. about ethics. But many people don't actually understand the difference between morality and ethics because right. it's been pulled out of the philosophical discipline and then other disciplines try to talk ethics and people start to think that ethics is somebody tell you what to do. And that's not really what it is. So, that's what I, yeah. <laughs> I was worried, I was curious about where that line is because in the, like, um, the main engineering thing, there is this line, it's like, um, oh gosh. Anyway, continue. I haven't totally absorbed it yet. It's okay. I definitely, around in my hear, head. I definitely, I'll say my piece on you. I definitely want to hear what was driving you crazy on the, uh, what, what their ethics, the ethical rules are, because that's where <laughs> my research is landing to. So first of all, let's go all the way back, right? Okay. So morality, morality is one's personal sense of right versus wrong. So let's say I personally feel that it is wrong to abuse animals. That's mm -hmm. my own personal morality. But that doesn't mean that John over there, and I'm saying a fictional John, um, over there, uh, believes that it's not okay, right? That he agrees with me. So his moral belief is it's totally okay to abuse animals because they're objects. Um, and as long as it benefits my needs, who cares? So that could be his personal morality. So right. morality doesn't necessarily mean good versus bad. That's right. the hard part. And a lot of people think morality has to come from a religion. It doesn't, okay? Mm -hmm. It's the idea of one's personal sense of right versus wrong. You know, we are not some kind of magical being. We learned our sense of right versus wrong from our parents, mm -hmm. from people we associate with, from our environment, and so forth, right? So that's morality. Now, what exactly is ethics? Then? Ethics is a group of rules adopted from certain sets of moralities, right, for the sake of creating a more just society. So we know there's a bunch of moral rules. People have a bunch of moral rules, but we start to ask, is this particular moral rule beneficial to, to the society, enhance society, benefits the masses, not just benefit a few, right. or actually risk with the life of many? This is actually when it gets to be a very complicated conversation, such as, for example, abortion. Right. Abortion satisfies a few, but are you trying to endanger many, many women's lives? Is that what you're thinking? So this is why those conversations have to happen. So ethics is not supposed to be a bunch of rules crammed down your throat. Now, now, I'm not suggesting, I am certainly not suggesting that there are bad ethical rules, because there are. There are some people who have divorced discussion of morality and ethics from philosophy. So it's no longer an honest intellectual exercise, and also what, what you say, query to think, is this rule correct or not? But they start to adopt it generation after generation, and it becomes this gospel. Right. Um, so we're not, so in the philosophy field, we don't really take anything for granted, nor do we say that we're not allowed to question anything. We will look at a set of ethical rules and say, oh, it's time to update. This yeah. is no longer working because we now have this new incident, this new scenario that makes your particular ethical rule no longer valid. So I don't want people to think that ethics is just this horrible rule that is supposed to help society survive. So what exactly is society, right? Society refer to a group of people mm -hmm. who are trying to survive together. Because you can be an individual hanging out somewhere in the jungle, but you probably won't survive very long, okay? So human beings form society so we can survive. But in order to keep society intact, which is a group of people preventing us from killing each other and surviving longer, we have to create rules that is somehow beneficial for everyone involved as much as possible. This is actually what ethics is. Now, some of the ethical rules have adopted into law. So now we have laws, right? Constitution and law. So not all ethical rules make it into law. But ethics is a conversation 
that discusses whether or not some of this should go into law. That's why students of uh, students who want to be attorneys must take philosophy for several years before they are allowed to go into law school. This is actually a requirement because it's a precursor to understanding why certain laws have to be there. And if the ethics change, then some laws will not work anymore. That's how that works. Okay. This is um. I I think that was the fine line for me. I like wish I had my book in front of me, um, but there are four main principles in engineering, just general, general engineering. And it seemed like there was a fine line between, like it all seemed pretty clear until I think it was the third one. And it had to do with um, having loyalties um, for the organizations and people that you're working with, which I totally get. Like, you know, if you're working on a project together, there, there are a lot of things that come into play um, that are very important. Um, and the way it was worded, sometimes those interests don't necessarily, um, those, those ethics, the ethics of the organization might not jive with the ethics of even that um, kind of engineering creed, um, which was very interesting to me. Um, so like, I mean, I just, I just picked up on this yesterday because I'm just like, okay, how, you know, because I'm finally reading the material. I'm like, oh, this is, this is where we're at. Um, and so like my whole idea about ethics is absolutely changing um, because I didn't know that ethics changed. I thought ethics was, you know, a set guideline um and then just thinking it, it bumped my understanding out because like i've been a massage therapist and so my ethics as a massage therapist looks a lot different than um you know someone who works for nasa um it looks a lot different than someone who's a journalist um th so the ethical um guidelines for being a journalist are the reasons i am not a journalist um <laughs> um and just um you know, when you're in certain service, modes of service, like um, there's a difference between civil and military engineering, for example. Um, and so those ethics are going to be different. And so like, that was my cognitive dissonance of this week. It's just like, holy crap, like, now I know why these students were looking at me weird when I didn't know what I was talking about, you know, on those first couple of days about um, where they're at and what ethics looks like to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's the part I'm curious about is like, to me, like I, I did feel a lot of discomfort when I saw like that rule number three and it, it was almost like, yeah, but if you're working for an organization, if your ethics are different, you're going to be working differently. Um, and so like, I'm curious about like when, when, when philosophy sees the issue and then um, starts querying it, like what's, what's um, kind of a layman's um, uh, view of the process that needs to happen. And even if, I don't know if you can determine the length of time, but the process that needs to happen for those changes to happen, um, because we're talking about humanity. That's huge. Yep. So I'll plug a little bit. In September, I will be doing a presentation about the ethics and computer science mm -hmm. um, and engineering for IEEE. <laughs> so, so IEEE is the big league for engineers and computer scientists and so forth. And I was going to discuss some of the problem with the ethics of uh, computer sciences leading to Palantir, leading to Facebook, leading to Google doing the things that they've been doing and that we have no recourse or, or understanding how to deal with it. So first of all, there is this, let's just be clear, uh, no one likes a philosopher. Um, <laughs> philosophers, <laughs> no one likes us at parties. We always question, we always shake, shake your foundation because everyone, here's the thing, human beings feel comfortable like we're surviving if everything we know is on solid ground, that we, we, we know that static, nothing will change, I'm right. The feeling of rightness, the feeling of rightness, make us feel like we'll survive. Because again, back in the day, when we were in the jungle, cave people, we don't really know right versus wrong until grandma got eaten by a you know, saber tooth tiger or something. So we figured out certain rules as, as we learn, right? Um, so going back, <laughs> going back to this, which is no one likes a philosopher. Here, here's the thing. 
corporations, in order to protect their profits, certainly has a set of rules, right, that they would put on the employee. So when an engineer or a computer scientist, you know, when they go through their training, they, they learn computer science ethics, right? They learn engineering ethics, right? Mm -hmm. And particularly ethics, obviously, has to do with not harming others. And I'm generalizing a little bit, but not harming people based on what you do. Like, for example, if you're constructing a building, you better make sure it's going to last more than five years and not just, oh, it's okay now and it's okay to crash later. Because you're going to wonder, did I do the right thing by switching out material? Am I allowed to do that to save some money? Obviously not. So right. you're taught certain set of ethical rules so you become a decent person when you go into society. But right. when people go into a company, because a company, hey, there's a big word, C word, capitalism. For the sake of money, right? For the sake of money, these companies have their own rules. And let's not, let's not always give credit to some of the rules being great. Ethical, and I want to say ethical in terms of for the greater society, not for the little group of people in a company. Right. Okay? So the rules that they have might be great for the people in their company. But if it starts to affect a greater population, then the government might come after them or the citizen might rebel. So I brought up Palantir, and I'll, I'll mention Palantir for just a second. Not everyone knows who they are. Mm -hmm. So remember President Trump <laughs> put children, uh, immigrant children in, in camps, so yeah. child camps, child concentration camps, okay? Now, who was actually helping him collect data on where the children are and how to catch them? Palantir. Mm -hmm. Palantir is a data analyst company. Okay, and what they were doing, they were tracking the children for the government. Now, the employee of Palantir said, well, we're loyal to you. So they kept working at it without thinking about it, without thinking about the responsibility they had. Because they say everything right. we're doing is following company rule. Everything we're doing is following company rule. But mm -hmm. eventually, when they start the devastation, the horribleness, the human tragedy, okay, that was caused by them tracking, separating children from families, it was... It's still happening today, okay? Mm -hmm. That some of the employee protested. And the fear, even in the risk of them losing their jobs, they, they stood out and said, wait a second, what we're doing is okay for your bottom dollars, for your company's uh, profitability. But what we're doing is actually hurting greater society. So we need to step back and protest. That's what you're actually talking about. So this ethics is not some kind of... It, it, Ethics, again, should be framed as helping rules that help the greater society, not for a, a small entity. The mm -hmm. entity can have certain ethical rules, and if you read and go, okay, it doesn't look like it will harm other people, the employee might willingly follow it. But people are starting to be more and more and more conscious, right? There's this term that everyone uses, woke, more yeah. woke, <laughs> whatever that means, more woke, right? So because of that, and also because we have brave citizens protesting right now, Right. Tech companies can't really just think that employees are not going to think about the extent of their rules and how that influence others. I'll give you another example. So Facebook, like many companies, are trying to install facial recognition software everywhere. Okay? So is the, uh, what's it called? Mm -hmm. Is it Google? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I don't want to give, give the, the wrong, oh, Amazon, oh, sorry. I do not want to blame Google for this. Amazon has a particular grocery store called Amazon Go. Um, so Amazon Go is basically, there's no cashier at all in the store, right? So people can go in there and it's using facial recognition software as well as sensors around the store to see mm -hmm. who you are. And if you pick up something, it will automatically deduct money from your credit card when you leave the store. So it's completely cashierless. If you put something back on the shelf, it will credit you back for the item. So how do they do that? Tracking your face invading your privacy, knowing where you're at all time, knowing where you are in, in the world at all time. If someone hacked that system, they will know that you are at the grocery store, not at your house and rob. So this data is everywhere, right? But again, this is a, one of those things where Amazon employees, some of them protest and go, I don't think it's right to have facial recognition software. I don't think that's right because you're actually invading people's privacy and they don't understand how our technology works, nor do they understand the risk that they're in when we're collecting their face as an identity. Right. Okay. So California, for example, these protests, particularly think about ethical rules about not harming the society. 
takes into effect. California already passed a law that says no facial recognition software. So it's not as if our protests don't work. It's just that people don't understand what's, what the risks are, what is involved. So that would be one example there where the employees are reflecting, though, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I know your question is specifically asking, well, how do we get someone to reflect on the rules that they made? The way you would pull that, again, I gave you some examples, but the real question you have to ask, ask yourself is, can I show them a demonstration of how following this rule for a company can actually cause greater harm to the society as a whole? Society right. means the United States or even the globe. If your company is openly polluting the rivers, <laughs> dumping toxic waste, and you're saying, well, they pay me a lot and I'm considered a great employee for doing all this. Well, if you're doing this, you're willing, you're complicit. You are a complicit employee. Even if your company prays you, you need to have a wherewithal, this mental mindset to say, am I working for the culprit? Am I actually doing something that promotes some great evil, or great, I don't want to say evil, that's the wrong term, great harm onto the world. So I think that's a very difficult conversation to pull, but that's what you need to do is to show them, okay, let's go through that thought experiment, shall we? Very if you follow this particular okay. rule, what could happen to, for example, African Americans, to Asian Americans, to everybody around your neighborhood? What happens when we gentrify a neighborhood? What happens when we do? These are the things that we have to ask. You know, and that's, I think that's the conversation. So I don't, I definitely don't want you to think that ethics is some evil thing. It's, it's more, oh, no. they, it has to be constantly questioned and it has to change if new events show up that tells us that the existing rule does not work. There has to be a way to supersede your loyalty, for example, to a company. If the company is promoting, promoting great harm or doing some great harm out there and yeah. people are protesting today because of it. Yes. And that that seeing the protests and stuff has definitely given me a lot of hope because like on the surface level and the things that are being amplified and are so loud right now is like mass stupidity. Right. So like we're, we're seeing a lot of that, like in the media and like um, uh, maybe in our feeds or wherever. But the thing is, is um, there's also a ton, like just so many more people now who are like, no, this isn't okay, this isn't right. And they're stepping up and moving into places that, you know, that might endanger their lives um, because they're like, no, we're not gonna stand for this. Um, and and so it gives me a lot of hope. Like, and even even like seeing the way ethics works, like I don't, I don't see it as an evil, it's just like, it's, um, I know that good ethics are 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 there to protect everyone, um, and so that's. I'm trying to get to like what am I trying to think of? Like I'm thinking about very young people who, you know, they're coming from all these different places, and they may or may not continue with the same morality after they've gone through this process, or they might go harder back to the morality. But there's also they get to they they kind of by part themselves a little bit, I think, um, between their work and, and their morality. So like, I don't know, those things are very interesting to me. Like, I don't totally know how to think about them because um, I, I haven't practiced thinking about them, but it is, it is like, it's kind of exciting and a little bit scary. It's just like those, those um, ethical guidelines are, are there because it is with foreknowledge of what human nature is, I guess. <laughs> um, and so it's like setting them in place so that, um, because it's, it, it feels like it's the best thing we can do because we can't change human nature. Um, that's what it felt like when I was reading it. And that's, that's when my heart did like this thing when I noticed that kind of, um, I don't want to call it a discrepancy, but it was just like, um, kind of like when in this situation these rules might fall off and then of course when you're in these specified categories <clears throat> the, the ethics are probably going to look a little different too yeah <coughs> excuse me no that's that's fine um and the best we can do uh, philosophers <coughs> we, we ask questions a lot 
and we give people space to think and, look, and ask questions, but no one can get defensive and not say, oh, I can't go there. And right. the thing is, with these kind of environments, especially with your student, for example, as you're trying to get them to think about these issues, all you can do really is ask them questions and see how they will respond to that. And whether their responses, and it becomes complicated, right? Whether their responses benefit them or benefit a greater society or just benefit a few. For example, uh, we know in the media right now, we talk about Black Lives Matter, which is a very important movement. And some people say, oh, only Black Lives Matter. Like, just a very stupid conversation. But the idea is that, the idea is a very basic ethic, ethics rule, right? If something was wrong with the law, if it doesn't protect the masses, the talk of the citizens, but a select few of the citizens. So if a group of citizens is no longer benefiting from the way the law is structured, by right, the way the society is structured, society has to change. So the fact that Black Lives Matter movement is actually happening is telling us that there's a big group of people who are not actually benefiting by contributing to a society. We don't contribute to a society or want to exist to a society if we don't think that we're benefiting from that society somehow. And the fact that there's an explosion means that there's a big group of people who are being left out. And it's not, not to dismiss the movement. There are lots of minorities, not just, and of course, LGBTQ, of course, right? There are pockets of people who are no longer benefiting from the system. So there are protests, but eventually what we hope, what we hope, right, is that young people maybe study philosophy, <laughs> hopefully, go into law and try to change the law. Because like everything else, laws change. We still have laws in Colorado, for example, okay? In Colorado, we have laws that are on the books that have never been striked off. So I, I'm trying to remember if it's the exact day. Like you can't ride your horse after 3 p.m. on someone's lawn on a Sunday. And you're going, what? That's a law? That's a real law? <laughs> <laughs> why, why is that still a law? That is because back in the day, the landowners were trying to protect their land. So they, you know, got somebody to pass a law to protect their land. But yeah. like everything else, there is a time limit to laws, okay? There are certain things that you can improve upon. And we're not saying to strike all laws down, but something you can improve upon it. And this idea that, okay, you can't ride your horse in it. No one's riding horses unless you're on a horsing range or something. No one's riding horses of primary transportation. So the fact that this law is still there shows you that laws uh, needs to change. And why don't we strike that down? That's because there's no money striking that down. Like th th there's has to be a turn is, oh, I'm gonna go challenge that because there's money in striking it. There's no money in challenging that. So there's a lot of stupid laws that we still have antiquated laws uh, that we have every state. If you actually search for bad laws every state, you will see tons of laws are still on the books and people are like, why, why is that still a law, <laughs> right? And we just, and, and you know what? And we, we know that uh, Governor Polis recently struck down the language specifically about slave, uh, slavery uh, putting, putting people in prisons, and that was actually the worst slave actually appeared in Colorado's constitution. Many people are not educated on this. These are the kind of things that needs change, but, but you can't think of ethics or laws as some kind of weird, you know, commandment that is always going to be there, and it's always intended to be good. At some point, they might be good, but certain laws, as well as certain ethical thinking, might have to change. Ethic is the guideline, and laws are adopted as solidified, because what exactly is law? Law is applied ethics, but what is applied ethics? The idea that you can actually punish people for breaking some of the ethical rules. Whereas ethics is just try to be a good person. We tell you how to be a good person, but laws are saying uh, we will punish you, right? If you don't follow these rules. That's really the difference. But understand these things are all tied together. So when students are saying, well, we have my, uh, I have my own moral rules and I come to the school and I go to, great, you have your moral rules. It's okay for you to shoot BB guns at a dog. But if you're at, if you're at college and there's a dog walking around, you better not bring your BB gun to shoot the dog because it's, it, it breaks ethical codes, right? And also, for example, Sue says, hey, I'm used to plagiarizing, okay? I'm from a country that where we plagiarize all the time. What's the big deal, right? Well, you're in a different place. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why plagiarizing is harmful. So we actually write out what's harmful about it. So we have to gain an understanding in order to feel confident about enforcing certain ethical rules. But it's not a dead thing. And it's very, very complicated. And it has to be a constant, 
query, if you will, to change yeah. things. Yeah. This, this is exciting to me because when I, um, I did start a philosophy minor in my undergrad, I hated the um, students that I was in class with. And um, uh, and part of it was too, was um, like just like the entry level rhetoric. Um, and the entry level rhetoric did make it seem like philosophy was something that was static to me. And um, also it felt like a broken system where you could like plug in anything and at the end of it, you, you, you kind of trap the person in front of you, um, whether that information was correct or not. And I, I do know that can happen, but I don't know how exactly it happens. Um, and just like, you know, so I, I really had some very strong negative um, feelings about all of that. But I, I mean, I, d I didn't follow it far enough, obviously. Um, and so it's really exciting to me to hear that it's a living practice really well let's say let's go back to our conversation regarding how every discipline came out of philosophy so for example creative writing yeah a lot of us are creative writers right creative writing had its own ethics people don't talk about that because they don't have the language right but how does creative writing work how does the field work how do people figure out this is what creative writing is how do we know that this is a poem versus this is a prose right versus this is nonfiction or this is fiction or this is flash Mm -hmm. How do we know any of that? There are genres, but those are ethics. Right. People don't understand the term. It's really creating a system. Every single thing you can think of, every single job you work in, for example, as a journalist and as a, a, a massage therapist, um, in your professional world, there are ethical rules right, that governs that. But it's created right, for to, to promote that particular discipline. But people just don't use the word ethics, and because it sounds like a dinosaur, they go, oh, it's this dead thing. No, philosophy started the conversation. You guys took off with it, but we never stopped having that conversation. In fact, whatever you created, we're going to go after it. So, for example, people in philosophy of technology are talking about, for example, the effect of drones, the effect of facial recognition software, the effect of biohacking, the effect of Neuralink. What exactly will happen? Is intelligence amplification going to win over artificial intelligence? What is our ethical duty to future generations? Should we even care about taking care of the earth if we can just change our biological makeup? These are the kind of conversations we're having. No one is going, I'm stuck at Socrates. No, you, you have to study some of those people so you understand how philosophy got here. But philosophy is actually constructing systems and breaking them. Every single system you create, there's a hole. There is no perfect system. Why is there no perfect system? We're imperfect, we're not gods. We are creating systems that's based on our own frailty, on our own blind spots. So every single thing, if you hate systems, the fact that we're in a Zoom right now, this is a system. Yeah. There's a way you code this thing to make it work. You can say, I hate systems. Zoom was <laughs> not working, <laughs> right? So you, there's also this concept, when a system is falsified, Right when it was, uh, you know, when it's fossilizing, mm -hmm. it's good to break a system to make new ones. So there's people in the constant conversation of that, but philosophy never say this is the right system. It's more as in maybe you took a class where they say here are all the famous people and you got to memorize and that's it. It's more as in they should have said here are the original system that was created and here's the next step to breaking and making it better. That's actually what philosophy is. That's why it's never, never dead. This is why I am so flexible. I can yeah. maneuver through disciplines like nothing because I understand they're just systems that need to be changed sometimes. That's awesome. Oh my God. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to close this up pretty soon, but I want to um, ask if there are any other things that you'd like to add, um, especially like for folks to be aware of or um, <laughs> things that people should be looking at. Um, and yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Right? My current research. Hmm. So I am, I am uh, like I said, I'm a person who can't say no. So currently, um, I am working with the Colorado Department of Higher Education. I'm promoting open educational resources. I went to Washington, D.C. I also work with the U.S. Department of Education. Um, specifically, they invited me because I wrote a paper regarding how to use blockchain technology to secure OERs. Now, blockchain technology is the underlying algorithm for making Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. But my concern, I'm not as obsessed with Bitcoin. I'm more obsessed 
with the potential of using this technology to protect the copyright and protect the, 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 uh, the origin of every single material that's, that's created out there, which is actually great for creative writers, great for artists who work is constantly being wrought all over the internet. And I think that's wrong. Same thing with student plagiarizing. I'm like, no, they, they, no. We need to trace the rabbit hole where everything is. Google search engine is not the answer. I can't find anything. So that's what I'm currently working on. And we do have a presentation in November with the Colorado Department of Higher Education on the Open Education Conference about the future of what open education looks like. And it's not just going to be OER, but open education as an opening students to understanding issues beyond the United States. That we're actually learning what's happening, for example, in Australia, what's happening in Japan, what's happening in New Zealand, and not live in our little bubble, in our little bubble, in our little system, and not understanding from an outside perspective how our system's not working. So that's the next step of what open education looks like, and I hope to contribute to that conversation in the next few months. That is amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I... I guess I'm, I'm going to close this up and I'm going to be buzzing all day with all of these ideas. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to talk with me. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. That was great.